Okay, the recording has started. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, it's my pleasure and our pleasure to have Dr. Steve Stegen here with us. Uh, so, Dr. Stegen is a postdoctoral research fellow in the Clinical and Experimental Neuropathology Lab of Professor Heert Carmelit at KU Leuven in uh, Belgium. Uh, if you remember, we had uh, Professor Carmelit a few weeks ago uh, in, a, in a debate with, um, with Professor Skipani, which was, uh, was very fun. And he currently holds a senior postdoctoral research grant from the Research Foundation of Flanders, FWO. Uh, and he completed his MSc in Biomedical Sciences in 2010 at KU Leuven, where he studied the effect of post-translational modification on chemokine activity. And after that, he, he got into Professor Carmelit's lab and he investigated the role of hypoxia signaling in skeletal cells. And for that, he was awarded also an FWO Junior Postdoctoral Fellowship to investigate the role of glutamine metabolism in skeletal cells. And currently, Steve's current uh, research is uh, focusing on the characterization of the metabolic needs of healthy and diseased skeletal cells. Uh, and he is expert in preclinical MOS models for fracture healing and osteoporosis, uh, bone imaging and histology, uh, primary skeletal cell isolation and metabolomics. Uh, Steve is a member of several scientific societies, such as the CTS, the ASBMR, and he presented and won several prizes for his findings. Uh, both at the ECTS, where he won the uh, New Investigator Award in 2021, and the ASBMR, where he also won the Young Investigator Award in 2016. And uh, more recently, he also won the Prize for Fundamental Research in the Belgian Royal Academy of Medicine in uh, 2021. Uh, so it, it will be our uh, great pleasure to hear his presentation today, which is about hypoxia signaling and metabol uh, metabol metabolism in cartilage and the regulation of chondrocyte function by glutamine metabolism. So Steve, uh, the virtual floor is yours. You can right. share your screen. Right. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. Good. Thank you, uh, Marco, for the invitation and the very kind um, introduction. I'm very happy to um, present our recent work on, on the metabolic regulation of uh, cartilage cells or chondrocytes uh, during uh, bone development. And so I will talk about two published studies um, linking the metabolic phenotype of chondrocytes uh, to hypoxia signaling um, during development. So, um, in general, our lab is interested in understanding the metabolic regulation of skeletal cell function. And uh, the reason for that is that if you think about what, in general, cell, cells have to do uh, functionally, they have to uh, proliferate. They usually uh, synthesize a lot of uh, extracellular matrix, and they survive. And often, especially in bone tissue, um, this is in, in harsh conditions characterized by hypoxia uh, and even um, some nutrient uh, limitation. And so um, these cells have to fulfill these specific functions in different uh, stages, whether it's bone development, bone homeostasis, but also bone repair and also bone pathology. And so um, people have looked at, at this from different angles. So they have looked at uh, transcriptomic regulation of these processes and also growth factors and hormonal regulation. And we like to think this more from a metabolic point of view. And the reason for that is like, like any other cell, uh, bone cells take up oxygen and nutrients and they metabolize these uh, specific nutrients uh, to, to, to provide these cells with the necessary fuel um, to perform these functions. And so um, one, one of these uh, fuels is of course energy in the form of ATP, but also um, we know that um, cells that are highly anabolic, like bone cells, they have to produce a lot of biosynthetic molecules, for example, amino acids or lipids. 
um, but also are involved in uh, redox homeostasis. And this, this maintaining of the redox balance is very important because um, uh, these cells often uh, reside in, in conditions of low oxygen. Um, and so, of course, um, um, we are very interested in, in unraveling or characterizing the metabolic needs of all these cell types and link this to specific cell functions. And so the model that we like to use in the lab is that of bone development. And the reason for that is that I've drawn here a, a schematic overview of a, of a part of, of the bone that is being developed. And so you can see here a structure which is called the, the growth plate, which consists of only one cell type, the chondrocyte or cartilage cell. And so this structure in the bone is very important to mediate uh, a longitudinal bone length. And so um, even though there is only one cell type present, the chondrocyte, there are different stages. So you have resting, proliferating, and hypertrophic chondrocytes. And so these cells have specific functions. For example, uh, they proliferate and they differentiate. And so that actually um, regulates uh, bone growth. And so these, these, these uh, hypertrophic chondrocytes, they actually um, um, secrete the template, which is um, uh, later on uh, replaced by uh, mineralized bone tissue. And of course, these cells have to survive um, as well to, per, to fulfill uh, the, the, the other functions as well. Now, what is most interesting is that these cells are in an environment completely absent of blood vessels. So this is an avascular uh, environment. And so, of course, if you consider that, as I just mentioned, these cells need oxygen and nutrients, these oxygen and nutrients, they are derived from the blood vessels. So that means that the further away these cells are located from the blood vessels, likely this also means that they have a specific metabolic profile in order to actually have these functions working in the growth plate. And this is very important because um, the expansion that these cells are mediating is really huge. And so recent studies by us and others have actually shown that um, um, different nutrients are involved in regulation of these functions. So a very recent study by our lab has, has shown that um, fatty acids from the environment are not that important to mediate um, chondrocyte function. They don't take up or metabolize uh, uh, fatty acids, but instead they are really dependent on glucose, glucose-derived carbon. So the current view is that glucose-derived carbons are um, predominantly uh, shunted away from the TCA cycle and oxidative phosphorylation but rather are converted into lactate in the process called um, glycolysis to generate energy in the form of ATP. And so the fact that these cells are highly glycolytic fits with the fact that these are in a low oxygen environment because they're far away from the blood vessels. Um, and and, and in, in this way, actually sustaining energy production. Now, as I just mentioned, there are many other different metabolic functions that also need to be met in order to have a good functional uh, growth plate. And so it actually raises the question, okay, how do these cells supply themselves for uh, redox homeostasis or for biosynthesis because they have to proliferate and, and generate a lot of extracellular matrix. So as we know from the cancer field, um, glutamine, which is the most circulating amino acid in, in the blood, um, is known to actually be involved in uh, redox homeostasis and biosynthesis, and even in uh, specific cancer cells, even um, can supply them with uh, uh, energy. Um, so we questioned whether and how glutamine metabolism contributes to um, uh, chondrocyte function during uh, bone development. So um, to do this, um, we made a, a transgenic mouse model where we uh, specifically deleted the rate limiting enzyme in glutamine metabolism, and that's uh, glutaminase 1 or uh, GLS1. And so we generated this specific knockout by um, crossing GLS1 flux mice with um, uh, three um, uh, transgenic mice um, under the promoter of a collagen type 2 um, uh, promoter. So that means that the deletion will be specific to uh, chondrocytes. So when we phenotype these mice, and I hope you can appreciate it from, this, from these pictures, we noticed that GLS knockout mice were significantly smaller than wild type litter mates. And that was further confirmed uh, when we measured body weight and tibia length. So these were all smaller in knockout mice. Um, now, it was already evident that this phenotype was uh, already occurring early after birth because 
and we look specifically at the growth plates, so the bone structure that mediates long bone growth, um, we found that both uh, the length of the growth plate, but also the size and width was significantly decreased in um, knockout mice. So then we wanted to know, okay, how does glutamine metabolism regulate commissary behavior? Because we found that knocking out GLS-1 had, had such a, a phenotypic effect. So we uh, focused on three main aspects. Uh, first, um, the regulation of chondrocyte identity, um, the, the effect on biosynthesis, and an effect on redox homeostasis. So when we looked at the expression of these typical um, chondrocyte marker genes in the growth plate, we found that both early and late chondrogenic marker genes were decreased in GLS knockout mice. So you can see that early markers like AGK or GOL2, but also more late chondrogenic marker genes like GOL10 and MMP and VGF were significantly impaired. Now we then questioned how, how, how does a knockout of GLS1 uh, result in such a, a decrease in, in chondrogenic gene expression? And we considered actually that um, there might be a, a link between the metabolic pathway that we were affecting and epigenetic regulation of gene expression. So basically, um, epigenetic um, regulation of gene expression um, allows uh, cells to turn off or on specific genes in order, for example, to differentiate in a specific lineage uh, or maintain a more stem cell phenotype. So um, recent studies have shown that actually metabolic intermediates are very important in regulating the enzymes that are um, um, mediating these epigenetic changes. For example, um, histone or DNA methylation um, or histone acetylation. And so, for example, um, the TCA cycle intermediate alpha ketoglutarate is a very important uh, molecule um, or metabolite to actually regulate um, uh, the activity of enzymes that mediate histone and DNA methylation. So we did the metabolomics approach by measuring uh, different metabolites and we found that indeed GLS-1 was reducing alpha ketoglutarate levels, but we didn't see any changes in histone or DNA methylation. So that couldn't explain why these uh, genes were decreased. Now, on the other hand, there is another uh, TCA cycle derived metabolite, which is called acetyl CoA, which derived from um, a citrate from the TCA cycle. And that actually regulates um, histone acetylation. And so, when we actually looked at histone acetylation, and I'm showing here uh, immunostaining for a specific uh, histone acetylation mark at um, uh, lysine 9 uh, of histone 3. I hope you can appreciate that in the GLS knockout growth plates, there was a significant drop um, in, the, in the amount of um, um, histone acetylation. Now, I'm not showing all the details or the mechanism here, but we could show that if we knocked out GLS1 in chondrocytes, that indeed there was a, a reduction in the production of acetyl-CoA, which in turn uh, resulted in a decrease in histone acetylation and that could actually explain um, the decrease in, in chondrogenic gene expression. Now, to actually validate our hypothesis, we used an in vitro model where we isolated uh, growth plate chondrocytes and treated them with a pharmacological inhibitor of GLS-1, which is called BPTS. And um, I hope you can appreciate that um, um, pharmacological inhibition of uh, GLS-1 in chondrocyte had a similar effect on gene expression, so there was a decrease in uh, both late and early uh, chondrogenic marker genes. But then we resupplied the cells with acetate. And acetate is actually a metabolite that can uh, generate acetyl-CoA independently of GLS-1 activity. And that actually restored histone acetylation and also the defect in chondrogenic gene expression. So we could show that actually uh, a GLS-1 or glutamine metabolism is important to mediate chondrogenic gene expression uh, via epigenetic mechanisms. Now, in the next step, we also looked at biosynthesis because we know that chondrocytes are highly anabolic cells and we wanted to see whether um, uh, knocking out GLS-1 had an, uh, an effect on uh, biosynthetic uh, properties. So we first looked at proliferation. So this is a Ki67 staining uh, of, again, a, a, a growth base of young uh, wild type knockout mice. And um, we found that actually the, the amount of Ki67 proliferating chondrocytes were significantly decreased in uh, mutant mice. 
The same was true for matrix synthesis, because if we quantified the amount of collagen type 2, which is the, the typical uh, extracellular matrix that chondrocytes produce in the, in the in the growth plate, that was actually also decreased in GLS-1 mutant mice. So indicating that indeed disturbing glutamine metabolism affected um, chondrocyte biosynthesis. Now again, I'm, I will not show all the data here, but we could show using metabolomics um, um, experiments that if we deleted GLS-1 from chondrocytes, that there was a decrease in another amino acid, which is called aspartate. And aspartate is known to be a very important precursor molecule for both non-essential amino acid synthesis, but also the synthesis of nucleotide. And so that actually could explain why there was such a decrease in matrix synthesis, but also proliferation because cells that proliferate need both non-essential amino acids and nucleotides and cells that, that actually excrete a lot of um, extracellular matrix need to synthesize protein from non-essential amino acids. Now to further confirm this, we again performed uh, or used the same um, in vitro model where we took um, uh, growth plate chondrocytes and treated them with the GLS-1 inhibitor PPTS. And also in this in vitro model, we showed that um, this strategy of not or inhibiting GLS-1 reduced proliferation and protein synthesis. And that if we again resupplied aspartate, which was, which was lacking, we could actually restore nucleotide levels and non-essential amino acid levels and again, restore the defect in proliferation and protein synthesis. So that actually indicates that uh, glutamine metabolism is very important in sustaining chondrocyte anabolism, and that was actually mediated by sustaining aspartate synthesis. Now, finally, we also looked at um, uh, cell survival because it's known that um, glutamine metabolism might actually regulate um, redox homeostasis. Um, and so what we did was we quantified um, the number of um, um, cell, cell death um, in the growth plates of young mice using a, a tunnel uh, immunostaining. And I hope you can see that actually there was a, a lot of tunnel positive um, dead cells in um, a GLS-1 non mice, indicating that um, um, glutamine metabolism is important to maintain cell survival in the hypoxic growth plate. So again, we looked at the mechanism behind this and we found that if we knocked out GLS-1 in chondrocytes, there was a reduction in the potent ROS scavenger and glutathione. And so glutathione is very important to keep um, ROS levels in check that otherwise, if, um, if there would be an accumulation of, of ROS, uh, there would be a, a, a cell death phenotype. Now, again, we took advantage of our in vitro model um, where we treated um, chondrocytes with BPTS. And so here again, in the vitro model, we saw that there was a reduction in cell viability. And what we then did was resupply a cell permeable glutathione analog. And this again restored um, um, the, the defect in cell viability by reducing um, um, ROS levels. So indicating that uh, glutamine metabolism also regulates a cell survival by mediating um, a redox homeostasis. So to end this part, I hope to have convinced you that in normal um, uh, conditions, uh, glutamine metabolism is very important to maintain chondrocyte function during bone development. And so it has actually three metabolic functions that are key um, uh, to maintain the function of the chondrocytes. First, it's generating acetyl-CoA necessary for um, epigenetic regulation um, um, of gene expression. It also generates nucleotide and amino acids, which is in turn necessary for sustaining um, the anabolic response of chondrocytes. And finally, they generate uh, a glutathione from glutamine uh, necessary to keep uh, a proper redox homeostasis and cell survival. And so very interestingly, and, and in sharp contrast to, to, for example, cancer cells and other cell types, Glutamine metabolism does not regulate um, energy homeostasis in chondrocytes, and, and likely um, uh, glucose is therefore uh, more important. So, um, as I just mentioned in the beginning of the talk, um, these chondrocytes, they actually reside in a, in an avascular environment, and that actually also indicates that um, cells that are located away further from the blood vessels are also limited in um, oxygen availability. 
And so um, beautiful work by, uh, amongst others, uh, Professor Skipanu, who, who visited your uh, department or gave a, a virtual debate uh, recently, could actually show that um, it is very important that chondrocytes possess a mechanism whereby they um, can, can sense and respond uh, changes in oxygen availability. And so the tran transcription factor, HIF, or hypoxia-inducible factor, HIF1 alpha, is very important in mediating the, the response to low oxygen because it's um, uh, regulating um, uh, chondrocyte survival in two ways. First, it, 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 it uh, transactivates uh, a VGF expression, uh, which is uh, necessary to attract new blood vessels. And on the other hand, it can also um, um, adapt metabolism in such a way that, that these cells can survive in a hypoxic environment. Now, this is true for centralized uh, or centralized, centrally localized uh, chondrocytes. But of course, the cells or the chondrocytes that are at the periphery um, of the growth plate, these cells are closer to blood vessels. So indicating that here, if signaling is likely not important or not desirable, and that actually regulatory mechanisms should be in play to keep HIF levels um, um, on the low side. And so indeed, um, these um, um, sensing mechanisms to keep uh, HIF levels in check are performed by HIF proleal hydroxylases or PHD enzymes, which are considered to be really the oxygen sensing um, um, machinery of the cell. And so, um, when, when, when there is sufficient oxygen um, available, these um, um, enzymes will uh, target HIF for proteosomal uh, degradation. So we then actually wondered whether these PhD enzymes are necessary to prevent uncontrolled HIF signaling, especially at the periphery, and therefore also metabolic dysfunction in the hypoxic growth plate. So to answer this question, we used another transgenic mouse model where we knocked out the main oxygen sensor PhD2 and that actually resulted in a constitutive and constant activation of HIF-1 alpha um, dependent signaling. Um, so what we found that was that in, in these PhD2 knockout mice, that also here growth plates were smaller, uh, resulting in, in, in smaller mice. Um, but here the defect uh, was caused by a, a, a lack of energy caused by decrease in oxidative phosphorylation. Now. Um, I will not go into all the details, but um, um, what you should remember from this is that in normal conditions, um, while the majority of the glucose-derived carbon is shunted away into lactate via glycolysis, there is still some glucose carbon entering the TCA cycle for oxidative phosphorylation to maintain full proper ATP production. Now, of course, in the conditions where we have increased HIF-1-alpha signaling, what you would expect is that is indeed that there would be an, an even further accumulation of uh, a glycolysis and that carbon of glucose is, is fully depleted into the TCA cycle. And so again, if we measured oxidative phosphorylation in PhD2 uh, mutant um, cells, we found that oxidative phosphorylation was decreased and that actually resulted in a decrease in ATP levels. Now to confirm this um, uh, drop, in um, ATP was derived from uh, undesired uh, switch towards more glycolysis. We treated cells and mice with DCA, which is a blocker of PDK, which negatively regulates um, uh, glucose carbon flux into the TCA cycle. So what we found was that if we treated the, the cells with DCA, that we could restore glucose flux into the TCA cycle and decrease glycolysis. And so therefore we increased indirectly oxidative phosphorylation and therefore again um, uh, increased ATP synthesis. So if we then looked at tibia length, um, we could completely restore the defect in growth, indicating that indeed um, the, the decrease in growth plate size was caused by an energy deficit, um, caused by decrease in, in oxidative phosphorylation. Now, and this was even more um, surprising when we looked at the bone that was formed in these mice, we found that actually there was an increase in the trabecular bone volume, both in early um, uh, or in young mice, but also in, in, in more early uh, or in, in more mature um, mice. Now, 
we looked at recombination um, of, of the PHD2 gene in other cell types in the bone, like osteoblasts or osteoplasts, but we couldn't find any evidence that PHD2 was deleted, nor that there was a functional effect on osteoblasts or osteoclasts. So likely, the defect was more chondrocyte and cartilage intrinsic. So indeed, when we looked at um, the bones here, so this is a, um, a zoom in of the trabecular bone region in the in the metaphysis of uh, wild type and, and knockout mice. I hope you can appreciate that we have here in red uh, accumulation of the typical um, um, cartilage rem, uh, a cartilage um, that is being produced by the chondrocytes. So that means that in normal conditions, the cartilage that is produced by chondrocytes is degraded and is replaced by the specific bone matrix, but this was not the case in the knockout mice. So there was accumulation of the specific chondrocyte matrix in the bone matrix. Um, so when we also looked at the cartilage degradation, we found that when we measured specifically in the serum breakdown products of collagen type 2, so that means the, the specific chondrocyte matrix, we found that this was decreased in mutant mice. So um, we wondered whether um, these knockout chondrocytes were producing a collagen type, type or a, a collagen uh, matrix that was so modified that it would prevent normal cartilage remodeling, and that actually resulted in increased bone volume. Um, so um, this is a very short schematic on how normal collagen synthesis works. So uh, a pro-collagen um, um, molecules are hydroxylated in the beginning, and uh, uh, the sulfide bonds are formed. Um, after that, a triple helix is formed that is cleaved and further cross-linked to make these uh, rigid collagen fibers. And so we know that if you have uh, problems with collagen hydroxylation, this ultimately affects the strength and the cross-linking as well of these uh, collagen fibers. And so when we measured collagen hydroxylation, we found that this was increased in mutant mice. And that was associated with an increase in, in cross-linking. Now, to, to actually link the fact that these um, collagen fibers are more hydroxylated and therefore more cross-linked, whether this was resulting in a more rigid uh, a collagen matrix, we performed a degradation assay. And so what we did was we took growth plates from wild type and knockout mice and treated them with MMPs. And so these MMP enzymes are very um, important because they mediate a normal collagen breakdown in vivo um, before the, the, the matrix is being replaced by bone tissue. So we use two of the most known MMP isoforms, MMP9 and MMP13, and measured uh, the, the amount of collagen breakdown by measuring hydroxyproline levels in the growth plate. So that means that um, the hydroxyproline that is left in the growth plate is a proxy of how much collagen is still left. And so when we measured this in wild type and knockout, we found that there was more, uh, relatively more hydroxyproline remaining in the growth plate of knockout and mice. So indicating that indeed these uh, uh, collagen modifications hinder proper collagen breakdown that is normally known or normally important for um, a proper bone uh, formation afterwards. Now, of course, we know that um, um, active HIF signaling or that hypoxia um, uh, signaling um, interacts or, or regulates the activity of collagen hydroxylases um, or the enzymes that, that perform the collagen hydroxylase activity because these enzymes use oxygen and it's known that, for example, um, in, in hypoxic conditions, uh, you can modulate the activity by just playing with the amount um, of oxygen that is there. But we actually want, also wondered whether other metabolic um, um, molecules were responsible in, in, in changing the activity of the collagen hydroxylases that could explain the increase in um, um, matrix rigidity. So we found actually that one of the most important um, substrates for uh, hydroxylase activity, alpha-ketoglutarate, was increased in a PhD2 knockout mice. And so we can confirm that by doing a metabolic tracing experiment that these knockout cells take up more glutamine from the environment, they convert it more into glutamate and alpha-ketoglutarate, so indicating that these have a higher glutamine flux. And this was actually HIF1-alpha dependent. Now, to prove 
that um, these metabolic adaptations were responsible for the changes in collagen hydroxylation. We performed an assay where we measured hydroxyproline levels in the presence of PPTS, which is the, the GLS-1 inhibitor. And so we found that if we blocked GLS-1, that there was a reduction in glutamate and alpha-ketoglutarate levels. And this ultimately resulted in a reduction of hydroxyproline levels. Now, to further prove that this was metabolically regulated, in conditions where we treated the cells with PPTS, we again added dimethyl alpha-ketoglutarate, which is a cell permeable alpha-ketoglutarate form. And this fully restored again the high uh, collagen hydroxylation um, in these cells, indicating that um, PhD2 knockout cells actively engage glutamine metabolism to synthesize more alpha-ketoglutarate, and that in turn uh, regulates uh, collagen hydroxylation. Now, this was all performed in vitro. We also wanted to test whether this could explain or modulate the in vivo phenotype. And so this is, again, a wild type and a knockout mouse, where we again have this collagen um, remnant accumulation and an increase in trabecular bone volume. And so again, we did the same rescue experiment as we did in vivo, so where we treated the mice with BPTS. And so you can see that this completely normalized the amount of cartilage remnants and the increase in bone mass. And again, if we then treated knockout mice with alpha-ketoglutarate, we could again increase the amount of collagen matrix and also the effect on bone mass. So to end this part, I would like to um, um, share this um, um, overview slide stating that um, glutamine metabolism has to be tightly regulated to avoid a cartilage dysfunction. And so um, the second part of my talk, um, I hope to have convinced you that hyperactive glutamine metabolism induced, for example, by high HIF-1 uh, alpha signaling results in uh, collagen over modification and uh, uh, cartilage remnants, which ultimately results in skeletal dysplasia. Now, on the other hand, using the model of GLS-1 deletion, we could show that impaired glutamine metabolism also is negative for chondrocyte function because it's decreasing or impairing chondrocyte identity, chondrocyte uh, anabolism, and causes um, cell death, and ultimately resulting also in a growth plate defect. So that means that you really need a balanced glutamine metabolism uh, in order to maintain normal ca cartilage um, homeostasis. Now, of course, um, this was uh, mainly during bone development. And so now we are doing some experiments on the role of glutamine metabolism in postnatal cartilage. Um, and so I will share some, uh, briefly share some unpublished work on this. So we know that um, Chondrocytes are not only present in the growth plate of long bones, but also line the articular surface. Um, and so this cartilage is very important because it's mediating um, a low friction movement of the joints. And so these chondrocytes have actually, they're a very steady state phenotype. They survive, but they hardly proliferate and they have a very low matrix turnover. However, um, um, Resources have shown that um, caused by uh, uh, many different factors, there can be a phenotypic shift in these cells, um, um, inducing proliferation and increasing matrix synthesis, and also increasing cell death, um, um, resulting in a condition which is called osteoarthritis. And, that, and so that actually results in joint failure. Um, so what we first did was actually um, um, investigate how uh, glutamine metabolism is involved in homeostasis of no, normal um, postnatal cartilage. And so we used an in vivo model where we injected the GLS-1 inhibitor BPTS um, in the joint cavity. And so what we found is actually if we quantified the amount of cartilage damage that was induced, that there was a significant upregulation of cartilage um, damage um, when GLS-1 was inhibited. So indicating that indeed Maintaining a proper glutamine metabolism also postnatally is important to uh, avoid cartilage damage. Now, on the other hand, we also profiled chondrocytes that were isolated from OA joint regions. And what we there, for, what we there saw in human-derived samples in OA, that there was an induction 
of um, enzymes involved in glutamine uptake, so these are glutamine transporters, but also glutamine metabolizing enzymes. And so if we then measure the amount of um, uh, different metabolites or glutamine-derived metabolites, we found that there was a significant increase in uh, human OA samples, so indicating that there might be a hyperactivation of glutamine metabolism also in OA. Now, what we then did also in using an in vitro model of, um, of gerotritis, where we treated uh, articular chondrocytes with different cytokines that are known to induce uh, OA-like phenotype, we found that in normal conditions, these cytokines indeed induce uh, a, a decrease in the normal anabolic gene expression and increase um, uh, hypertrophic or catabolic uh, chondrocyte phenotype, which is often observed in a way. But then if we treat it with a, um, um, uh, an inhibitor that blocks the activity of another uh, glutamine metabolizing enzyme, which is called uh, glutamate dehydrogenase, we found that this completely reverted the, the detrimental phenotype. So indicating that likely in a way there is a, um, an, an overactivation of glutamine metabolism that is also not desirable. So we're working on this further to link this more to chondrocyte dysfunction. So to end, I would like to thank all our collaborators in the lab uh, and abroad, uh, my funding sources and you for your attention, and I would be uh, happy to take any questions. So thank you very much, Steve. Uh, there was a fantastic presentation. Uh, uh, if you could please uh, remove the slides so that people yep. can see you better. All right. OK, perfect. So thank you very much again. Um, so we have uh, um, a couple of questions. Uh, and there is a professor Steady who would like to say a few words. And uh, I ask her if possible. Uh, that she could, uh, if she wants to ask her questions in person, she could click on the link uh, that is in the Teams uh, platform chat. Uh, so you can join us on WebEx. Uh, in the meantime, we also have other questions. Uh, so uh, the first one is from uh, Michela Ciocca. First of all, is uh, she's complimenting you about the presentation. So awesome presentation. Thank you, Dr. Stegen. Uh, my question is, do you think that central chondrocyte compared to peripheral one could have some differences because of the apoxia state and because of the, their distance from the blood vessels? Yeah, yeah, we think that's that's exactly the case. So um, um, what we're doing now is, for example, single cell RNA sequencing um, on the growth plate. And we see that at least at the transcriptional level, there are really some profound differences in uh, metabolic features of chondrocytes depending on the location, whether they're more hypertrophic, and so that means that they're more close by blood vessels or more centrally localized. So what we think is that it's really the environment that determines the metabolic state of a specific cell type, and that that actually also regulates their function in the end. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, Okay, yeah, uh, Professor Steady, first of all, he's uh, uh, saying hi, so <laughs> welcome to our webinar. Uh, she also put a question in the chat. So is the proliferation zone of the, uh, is the proliferation zone the only one affected by GLS-1 deletion or are there changes also in other zones? Yeah, so it's, um, that's a very good question. It's not only the proliferation uh, zone that is affected, it's also the hypertrophic zone um, that is decreased in GLS-1 knockout mice. And so if you look at the relative decrease of um, the size of the zone, um, the hypertrophic zone is relatively more decreased than the proliferative zone. So that actually means that um, the decrease in the hypertrophic zone is not only coming from a defect in that, that there is a defect in proliferation, but also that there is another defect. And so that actually is linked to the um, fact that there is a decrease in the uh, chondrogenic, typical chondrogenic marker genes induced by the epigenetic changes um, um, by GLS-1 deletion. So it's a, what we think is that it's a combination of both a defect in proliferation, but also a defect in maintaining the proper um, hypertrophy um, state that causes that there is a, 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 a relatively bigger drop in the hypertrophic zone. 
Okay, thank you very much for your answer. There is a follow-up from uh, Professor Teti. Uh, is the PhD2 deleted zone uh, bone uh, fragile given the excess of cartilage core in trabecular uh, trabeculae? Yeah, that was also my question. <laughs> yeah, so it's more it's more um, 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 easily breakable. It's not uh, so we did a three point bending test, and so we see that the bone is of inferior um, quality. And so that actually can be completely explained by the fact that you still have some cartilage remnants that are there. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, if you have any more questions, you can put them in the chat in the Teams platform. Uh, in the meantime, maybe I can uh, uh, ask one myself. So uh, as you showed, uh, alpha ketoglutarate is a, uh, let's say, cofactor for PhD uh, enzymes. And PhD enzymes are also important for HIF hydroxylation, correct? So uh, what is sort of, is there like a, a feedback loop between the two that could explain some of the phenotypes you observe? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we looked at um, HIF levels um, in chondrocytes when we um, resupplied the cells with um, the cell permeable alpha ketoglutarate form. And so at least at the time frame that we looked at, we didn't see any additional changes in um, HIF1 alpha levels. Um, what has to be mentioned is that the um, KM values for alpha ketoglutarate are different between the collagen hydroxylases and the PhD enzymes. So they both rely on AKG, but the amount that they need for their enzymatic activity is, is, is not the same. Um, and so um, that actually fits very nicely with the fact that the collagen hydroxylases are, uh, so the ones that are doing the collagen hydroxylation can still function in very, very low oxygen levels, whereas the PhD enzymes are, are already active or change in activity when there is a very small drop in oxygen. And that's why they are called also the oxygen sensors because they're very sensitive to very small changes in oxygen. Whereas the collagen um, hydroxylases, they don't have this um, high um, affinity for the oxygen. So that means, and that's also true for the alpha ketoglutarate. So there is the fact that we don't see a change in HIF levels is likely to be explained by these um, differences. It's a matter of concentration of uh, yeah. alpha ketoglutarate. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Great. Oh, uh, one more comment from Professor Teti. Uh, she's saying that it looks like an osteopetrotic bone. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it shows similar features. Yeah, that's correct. And, that's correct. Yeah. And also, great talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we have another questions in the chat. I have another, if you don't mind. Um, so. You showed that um, so obviously probably uh, hydroxylation is also important for other forms of, uh, of collagen, uh, also collagen one and other and other types. So, do you know uh, or are you going to to study the importance of uh, GLS one and related enzymes in uh, other matrix producing cells like osteoblasts or fibroblasts? Yeah. So um, we just recently published um, a paper on the role of GLS-1 in osteoblasts. Mm -hmm. um, and so there we see a similar, but not completely the same phenotype as for the chondrocytes. So what we see there is that if we knock out GLS-1 specifically in early osteoblasts, we use the Osterix Cree um, mouse line for that. Um, we see that there is a decrease in bone mass and the decrease in bone mass is um, in part explained by a decrease in amino acid synthesis and protein and matrix, matrix production. We haven't looked specifically at whether this also involves uh, collagen hydroxylation as such. Um, we, we measured hydroxyproline levels and it's decreased in the knockouts, but that can also just be because there is a decrease in matrix um, in general. Um, we haven't looked at the at the hydroxylation degree, but I, my hypothesis is that it might also be changed there. Great. Um, so maybe I can ask uh, one last question while people think about uh, if they want to ask the, uh, something themselves. Um, is there any um, form of uh, you know achondroplasia-like 
uh, diseases or uh, you know dwarfisms uh, related to GLS one. Um, I don't think that there is really a specific one for GLS one. Um, there obviously are achondroplasias that are linked to the um, uh, collagen hydroxylases. Um, of course, this is a gain or loss of function um, mutation. But what we show is that it's not only the genetic profile that matters, but definitely also the metabolic and nutrient regulation of these processes. So um, it might be that it's um, um, uh, an, an added level of regulation and that might actually explain why in some conditions a specific gene has such a specific effect on, on inducing uh, frontal dysplasia. Um, but I'm not aware of a specific glutamine or GLS um, um, gain or loss of function in these settings. Anyway, the pathway is uh, clearly important. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. that's good. Uh, hopefully the, the, your studies will allow to find some interesting uh, targets and, or maybe, you know, uh, alpha ketoglutarate supplementation or stuff like that to, yeah. to help with, the, with this kind of diseases. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so um, I think we currently have no more questions. Let me double check on the Robert's platform. Okay, no. Okay, so um, in this case, I think we can close uh, the meeting. Oh, just to say, I think something happened. Okay. Great. Uh, in this case, I think we can uh, close the meeting for today. So uh, I hope you all saw what top level science looks like. <laughs> uh, I think we all need to see this kind of uh, really, really top level uh, work, uh, especially students. We have a lot of students in our group. And we are very proud of, uh, of that. We, pr we pride ourselves with, having, uh, with taking students and putting them you know, together with the, with good science. So this was definitely one of these cases. <laughs> and um, so um, staying on the topic of science, um, I, I originally invited Steve for the day of science, which uh, uh, you all know is going to take place on the 22nd of July. So uh, the abstract submission is open. So to all of you who are listening, you can go in the uh, in the Teams platform, in the in the general channel of the MS team, and you can find the abstract submission form. You can submit a graphical abstract, an abstract, and in the future we also have an elevator pitch that you can submit. So um, please participate. It's going to be a very interesting day. We will have a Nobel Prize uh, speaking as well. So I hope we'll see you uh, see a lot of your abstracts in there. So um, thanks again, Steve, and I'll see you very soon. Bye bye.